wasn't going back and didn't want to speak to anybody. Did he discuss with them before he left that he was going or why he was going? No. He said, it, actually he told me that if he uh, had talked about it, that uh, he would have been kind of interrogated for um, two or three days and he wasn't prepared to go through that. And did you hear from them ever since? They rang up that night. So I passed on that message. I said, he doesn't want to speak to anybody and he's not going back there. Some years ago, the four main churches, Catholic, Church of Ireland, Presbyterian and Methodist, set up a committee to study and examine new religious movements and cults, Dialogue Ireland. Their field worker is Mike Gard. What we have here is, first of all, a person goes in with a normal emotional life, but gradually ideology, uh, being doctrine in this case rather than ideology, becomes more substantive than the feeling life. That means a kind of distancing takes place. Emotionally, they become separated. Uh, they may still, as you say, make contact about financial or petty matters, but fundamentally, they, they have a new family. What is it about being isolated from general society that worries you? Well, I suppose um, if, a, if a group remains very much to itself, I think there's always the danger that it could become too fundamentalist or it could veer towards uh, being a cult. At the time um, that this group went to Israel, you were on record as saying that you did not think they were a cult. Correct. Do you have more concerns in that area now? Oh, I certainly would. But of course, uh, in order for that to, to, to arrive at such a conclusion, you'd have to do a proper study. And that means that if the group is, is really a Christian community, then it must be open to Christian examination and to subjecting its ministry to outside uh, open scrutiny. Last year, the Pilgrims came to prominence again when one of its founders, Margaret Foley Smith, committed suicide. Margaret was the eldest of a large family and according to her siblings, was a happy, talented woman. After finishing college, she worked as a farm home advisor and later had her own column in the Farmer's Journal. She was very close to her family and participated in all family activities. The Foley's found that since Margaret joined the Pilgrims, this all changed. She became very distant from them and never showed any interest in their lives. Six weeks before her death, her sister Aideen, who lives in Scotland, had a surprising call from her. It was 11 o'clock one night, she was staying in a hotel in Dublin. So she just said she'd been asked to leave the community and could she come and visit me in Scotland? Or could she come to Scotland? Um, so yeah, I was very surprised. When she did arrive, how was she? What did she how did she look? Um, initially, I didn't recognise her because it had been a few years since I'd seen her. Her hair was bleached blonde. She used to have red hair, um, and she had a skin condition which. Uh, meant her face was very red and kind of blotchy. She was a bit overweight as well. Um, she just sort of she felt she'd made a mess of her life and um, that she hadn't been pulling her weight from the community. Just really uh, just blamed herself, she didn't attribute any blame to the community, she felt it was her fault for not fitting in, she felt she wasn't particularly good at things, she used to think she was good at practical things, but then she realised there were people who were much better than her at that, so um, she didn't really feel she had a useful contribution to make, and then they asked her to leave. It was her work and her family and her social life all in one. I just thought what a shock and how traumatic it must be to have to be suddenly kind of on your own after years spent with people like that and um, I just thought it was quite pathetic. I suggested at one point um, 
would you think of talking to somebody, like maybe some counsellor or something? But she said that they didn't really believe in seeking outside help. So despite the fact that she was leaving, as you thought at the time, she hadn't left the strictures of the community behind her? No, she still, yeah, she still, I suppose, after living there for so long, uh, she still adhered to their values. Um, I, like, it was kind of the impression that she was the one who had failed, the community weren't at fault, they were still uh, doing things right, but she was the one who sort of fallen by the wayside, I suppose, so she probably still believed in all their values, but just wasn't, didn't think she was a part of it anymore. Her husband rang her after only a few days. Yeah, I think she arrived with me on the Friday and her husband rang on the, the Monday night. Yes, out of the blue. I think he had been trying before but couldn't get through. So, um, so she was quite surprised to hear from him. So they seemed to have several conversations and then he wanted to talk to me and he wanted me to guarantee that uh, I would make sure that she got to the airport and she came back to face her responsibilities. He was sort of cursing and swearing a bit and quite like wound up, but uh, I didn't really have a chance to say much. I was just kind of listening to him for a few minutes and then he, he wanted to speak to Margaret again. Six weeks later, she was dead. None of us had a problem, I, I don't believe, in the life she chose. Like, mm. I, I thought it was different, but I admired it. She really cut herself off as time went on. Yeah, what I wasn't happy about was the fact that being in the community seemed to mean that she, the family was at a distance. Yeah. And I didn't see the reason for it because we had no problem with her being in the community. Mm. Margaret's no, other sister her. and brothers only heard from her I very occasionally, know. usually when she wanted money for some project. When she died, they found the pilgrims less than forthcoming when they asked about her death or what led up to it. Local journalists, who usually hear all about suicides, heard about Margaret's for the first time at the inquest. The first I knew of this woman's death was when I attended the inquest uh, last October. And it was one of a large number of inquests that were held that day. And it was held at the end of the day. It was kept until the very last. And it was extremely long proceedings. and. It was quite, I thought, an extraordinary story that emerged. Tell me what the story was in, in, in your own words. Well, the evidence was given that there had been a row between this woman, Margaret Foley-Smith, and her husband, Martin, that went on throughout the day. And by his own admission, it had become quite violent. Uh, he said that they had used hands and fists. Now, he did say that the woman, uh, his, his estranged wife, Margaret, was equally robust. Robust was the word he used back. And the impression was given of, of a protracted row that went on and was very violent during the day. I feel that even if we'd had no questions about, or no concerns, we would have wanted to go to the inquest anyway. This was the last way of hearing what had happened. So we would have gone to the inquest anyway. But we knew that this had arisen, that there was, that a file had been opened because there was bruising on the body. I was shocked when I heard that, that Margaret had been beaten in a physical row because, like, like I was really shocked. I was kind of shocked that the marriage was gone, but, like, that happens. But I, 